Okay, folks. Hey, I wanted to uh, thank all of you for coming today, and uh, hope you've enjoyed your nice meal here at the Gray Heron Grill. Uh, so today we've got a very special guest who is uh, going to be speaking us today, and his name is Andrew Kircher, and Andrew is here with his grandfather, John. Thank you for coming too, John, and I'm sure we'll get to hear a little bit about uh, your estimates too. Yeah, if folks want to, <laughs> if folks want to turn around so that they can see, uh, I'm going to be doing that myself so they can see the screen. Um, so, uh, wanted to let you know a little bit of background for uh, Andrew. Andrew's got a degree in history and also in philosophy from um, not too far away, Albion College, and he's also yeah. <laughs> go with what? Go Brits. Go Brits. And uh, he's also got a uh, MS in Historic Preservation from EMU. And he's worked at various uh, museums all around the state of Michigan. But uh, he's currently the Community Engagement Manager with the Port Huron Museums. Um, the way that Liz and I became acquainted with Andrew is that we went to uh, a local for us, the Wixom Public Library, and uh, he came in and did a presentation of the history of Michigan as told in shipwrecks, which was very interesting and uh, entertaining. And thought that uh, we both thought that he would be a, a, a good person to come and give us a talk, because on his talk list is uh, a couple of automotive uh, topics, which uh, we're going to be have featured to us today. And so as a, a, a proud owner of his 1958 Packard, some would say Packard Baker, uh, he's uh, uniquely qualified to uh, give us this presentation today. So I hope you all enjoy it, and we thank you very much for coming today, Andrew. Absolutely. Well, um, again, my name is Andrew Kircher, uh, as he mentioned. Uh, I really like cars, I really like history, so this was a great chance. I work at a museum. As I frequently like to tell people, you don't work in the museum field if you have a lust for money and power. Uh, so instead, this is kind of my side hobby. I get to do things like this, and this is what funds my fun projects of, of working on uh, cars. So this is something that I've really been interested in. Um, I have always kind of liked uh, cars in some way. We were talking at our table a little bit. My very first car, uh, when I went off to college in like 2008, was a 1976 Lincoln. So I had this giant land yacht, always kind of stuck out in the parking lot. So a few years later, when I was looking for a car to restore, I wound up uh, picking up this 1958 Packard, the same one that's out in the parking lot. I'm happy to show some folks uh, afterwards. I knew I wanted a car from the late 50s and thought about it long and hard, talked, uh, consulted a lot with my grandfather, John, that's him in the picture. It's the day I bought it. Um, back in 2017 in New Jersey, uh, we went all the way over there because I eventually kind of discovered this really kind of niche car, this 1958 Packard. Kind of working backwards in our presentation a little bit, this was one of the last thousand Packards made. They only made about a thousand Packards in 1958. We'll talk a little bit about the, the merger and how this all kind of came about. But I said like, oh, a car with some of the features I want. It's you know, rare as hen's teeth, but it doesn't necessarily mean it was out of my price range or, you know, wasn't impossible to find. It was sitting on a used car lot. I bought it from a guy named Skip in New Jersey. Uh, so, you know, Skip said, oh, you know, a little lady just dropped this off here a couple weeks ago. Well, it's not running, but you can probably get it running. And, you know, when we, we towed it out, there must have been, you know, five years worth of leaves compacted under it. And it's like, oh, how long did you say this was sitting here? Just a, you know, a couple weeks? And so that was my introduction to this world. The, the Packard, this 58 Packard, was such an odd duck. And so I was really excited to talk to a Studebaker club because a lot of people will recognize this is just a rebadged Studebaker, you know. And, and people will get very passionate about this online. People will say, oh, that's not really a Packard. I said, well, that's funny. It's what it says on the, the letters across the hood it says it's a Packard. It's what my title says. And, it's, I kind of enjoy getting to go to, you know, sometimes Packard club meets or park with the other Packard people, and I'll be next to somebody with like a, you know, 1934 dual cowl phaeton that's worth more than my house, and I'm saying, oh, I too am also a Packard. You know, and we get to share that common. You can ask the man who owns one. So I became very interested in both the history of Studebaker 
and Packard. And with such a kind of an ignominious end, I want to step back and talk about you know, how did we get here. Um, so this is James Ward Packard, um, the founder of uh, Packard Motor. You know, there are some car uh, company founders that are really tied to the long-term legacy of um, the car. I think about people like you know Henry Ford, who you know for decades and decades is so closely tied to the development of Ford Motor Company. It's not exactly the case with James Packard. He is involved with the company, but actually in some ways for kind of less than a decade. And the Packard company takes his name and moves on. But James Ward Packard uh, is from Warren, Ohio. So this is um, over by Cleveland, a little bit to the southeast there, if you can see that, right? Not too far from the Pennsylvania border. And as he was growing up, his father um, was uh, an early immigrant to the area. They had worked in a factory. And James and his brother, by the 1880s, had invested in a uh, electronics company, a burgeoning electronic company. They did lots of wiring as people were starting to use more and more electrical appliances. Shout out to my hometown hero, Thomas Edison, who grew up in Port Huron. And he comes out with the light bulb in the early 1880s, and it's, it's never the same since. And so in their company where they're making lots of electric mm -hmm. wires, have some patents with that, they do pretty well for themselves. Uh, they have a, a sister, I, I also was telling my table, I try not to go on too many, you know, long garden paths, but sometimes you come across one of these, like, nuggets of information. It's like, this is too cool not to include. Um, this is uh, James's um, sister, uh, Alaska P, for Packard, Alaska Packard Davidson, um, who, she's a pretty cool woman there on a the bike, and she also holds the distinction of she was the very first woman to become an FBI agent in the 1920s. Yeah, had nothing to do with, like, Packard Motor. She's just a cool woman. She could easily have her own whole biography, but too neat not to mention that that was, you know, another notable Packard. Uh, but uh, James's brother's company were making arc lamps. Arc lamps were really popular in the uh, 1870s and 1880s. All of you have probably done maybe some automotive work at one time or another, or you've been around a welder, you know how bright that is. Um, that's what arc lighting really was. You have um, two carbon rods melting into each other. And so he had done pretty well for himself. Um, so by uh, the 1890s, as early automobiles were starting to pop up around the country, also in Ohio, up in Cleveland, you had uh, Alexander Winton. Uh, who is a pretty famous name in early automobiles. And he has uh, cars. Uh, James Packard sees one of these one day, and actually when he's living in Warren, Ohio, an automobile comes to town. And the guy had taken out an ad in the newspaper and said, I will be in Warren, and I've got my horseless carriage, and if anybody wants to come see this, it's like 1897, you know, show up. And he said the guy pulled up in town. He has a pretty big house, because again, he's already kind of rich. And the guy pulled up right in front of his house. And he looked outside and he was just smitten with this idea of like, oh, that thing doesn't have, you know, a horse. That's really cool. I want to see it. And he immediately took a ride and then he said, I got to have one. And so he looked for the closest car that he could buy and he found one of Alexander Winton's. Winton had, of course, started uh, in the bicycle field as uh, most of the very early automobile uh, manufacturers uh, would. Uh, there you can see the Winton is a winner. Um, here you can see Alexander Winton working in his factory. There's a bicycle in the background there, and a tandem bike. So not only made bicycles, but then uh, dispense with a horse. The Winton motor carriage. Pretty interesting ad here. You know, $1,000, go buy one of these. And that is exactly what Mr. Packard did. Uh, Winton, the other reason that he's pretty famous is not only was he making these cars, he was a race car driver. He would drive his cars really fast. I love the aerodynamics of this particular <laughs> race car. Uh, very sleek in the wind tunnel, right? You better bring your own goggles. Uh, but probably the most famous race that Alexander Winton ever rode in, if you're familiar with automobile history, is this one right here in Detroit. And uh, Alexander Winton is one of the race car drivers, and the other, Here's a picture of him. Anybody recognize that? Hopefully in this group, maybe somebody will. Well, it's not Barney Oldfield. That was Henry Ford, the one and only race that he would actually race in. Uh, they would race. Henry Ford would actually win that race. It would give him the money and uh, the kind of prestige to go on to start Ford Motor Company and a lot of the backing. Again, there's a whole series of lectures we could do about this kind of thing. But an interesting connection with this Alexander Winton. So Winton, while he doesn't run that race against Ford, 
in some ways, Winton is now responsible for starting a couple of these major companies. So Winton's in some ways responsible for Ford, and in some ways responsible for Packard. Um, George Weiss was one of these guys that um, was working for Alexander Winton and friends with James Packard, and Packard bought one of these Winton motor carriages from George. And said, That's the car he has to have. Well, as he's driving it, it's running terribly. It's not working. I mean, this is basically an experimental automobile in 1897. This is not a refined piece of work. And he's even trying to go from Warren, Ohio up to Cleveland. It's 60 miles. It's like an all-day trip in one of these cars. And he doesn't make it. He's like five miles short. He has to get his car, like, towed in by a team of horses to Cleveland. And he's just so mad uh, about this uh, that Packard... Uh, would finally go to Winton. This is a song from a little bit later, but a lot of these early cars required such a tremendous amount of work as things would break uh, on them repeatedly. Uh, this is a great song. If you've never heard it, you'd have to get under, get out and get under to fix up his automobile. So when he goes to Alexander Winton, as somebody who's just paid a couple thousand dollars, which is an incredibly large amount of money in the 1890s, uh, for a car that doesn't work very well, well, Mr. Packard is kind of technologically minded himself. He has a lot of good ideas. He keeps bothering Alexander Winton about this and writing the factory and telegraphing him and saying, well, here's how you could make this a little bit better. Have you considered this? And finally, Winton one day breaks down and says, guess what, buddy? If you want a better car, you think you can do it so great, you build a car. Well, that was kind of the last thing to say to James Packard because he said, all right, fine, I will. And that's what he wound up doing. So this is the very first uh, Packard uh, in 1899 that James Packard uh, makes um, and decides to start selling and get into the game himself. One of the really cool things, this car still exists um, and uh, actually you can't see it as well in this picture. This is November 6th, 1899. So just squeaked by on that like 19th century cutoff, right? One of the cool things I like about this car <laughs> is the way uh, you would steer this. If you look in his right hand, he's holding like a spade handle. This is like the most awkward steering apparatus. You just twist this like left and right to steer the car. Um, very awkward, but again, nobody knew what they were doing, so it worked. Uh, but they open up a factory um, in uh, outside of Warren, um, 408 Dana Street. Here's what's left of that little tiny factory shop. Because the first year, they're going to make like five packages in 1900. A big auto manufacturer might make 50 cars a year. So this was still small uh, potatoes of an operation. But the Packard Automobile uh, was really known. They found the Ohio Automobile Company is what they call their car company initially. And you can already see one of their slogans that would develop very quickly is ask the man who owns one. Here's a, an improved model. Uh, they would have, and again, you can still see that big spade handle that he's holding on to to turn left and right. Uh, but by 1900, one of these early Packard distinctions, I think this is the Model C, uh, their kind of third iteration, they got a steering wheel. The first American cars certainly have a steering wheel, and there's some debate whether or not the French Penhard beat him to it. So Packard would actually have a series of innovations that we have them to thank for. One of them is just as simple as, how do you steer the car? How about you put a steering wheel to turn uh, the tires? Uh, one of the other big Packard innovations early on, this is not something we have to worry about today, uh, but Packard would actually invent the automatic spark advance in 1901. So if you've ever driven a Model T, you know, you've got to you know, retard the spark and pull it down to get the whole thing running smoothly. And that's just an extra step for a lot of people. I always kind of uh, laugh, I'm sure probably some of you have probably seen the posts that, you know, back 120 years ago, they would ask car owners and tell them, well, here's how you, you know, grind the valves in your engine and how to do that. And today they tell you, you know, like, don't, don't put your tongue on the battery, please. You know? <laughs> the, the, what we ask for out of a car owner today is a lot less than what they would ask 120 years ago. But that was just one way they could make things easier. One of the other big Packard innovations early on is the H-slot transmission. we have got a neutral gate right in the middle. So if you've ever uh, done any shifting, we have Packard to thank for this in innovation. You know, that a lot of the early cars, Model Ts, have a completely different transmission system. A lot of the other cars would have systems where you're you know, putting one lever into first gear and then pulling it up into neutral and then another gear to throw things into second on another lever. And as cool and as old-timey as that looks, 
it's not actually a very fun driving experience. So putting everything like this and having that neutral H gate, it's another Packard uh, innovation in those early years. And Packard really goes off like gangbusters. This is a great painting from about 1949. This was Packard's 50th anniversary, a retrospective, but it was a, a secretary coming in saying, there are people here who, who want your literature. They want information on your car. And they were so focused on, on breaking this 50 car a year mark by like 1901, 1902, that James Packard said, well, I don't have time to write any literature. We have more orders than we can handle. If somebody wants to know about it, they can. Ask the man who owns one. Just find somebody who has one and ask them. And this was a great advertisement for their company. And they would stick with that for the entire company's history uh, because it worked really well. And Jim Packard said, anybody who owns a Packard is going to say good things about it because we make a quality product. And that's definitely true. Uh, by like 1904, 1905, some of these early Packards, they're shooting at a completely different market. When we think about Henry Ford, and Ford Motor Company, famous with the Model T of, oh, this is the car for the masses, right? We're going to make it as cheaply as possible. At a time where a Ford was about $750, which is still pretty expensive, but that's one of the cheapest cars you could buy, Packards would start at about $5,000. So, um, there you can see again that uh, like a chip on his shoulder. Every Packard owner carries his Packard car. Everybody's always eager to show off. And what a snappy driving outfit that is. <laughs> <laughs> I like the mustache and goggles. But ask the man uh, who owns one. So early on, uh, Packard had actually brought on a guy, uh, Henry Joy, who would later on become the president. We'll talk actually quite a bit about him. He has a lot of impact on the uh, company. Uh, Joy had a real mind for marketing. He said, how can we make our car stand out? Because in 1902, 1903, this early 1900s, cars are still seen as experimental. You still as often see one broken down as not, and you know people will say, oh, get a horse, buddy, you know, when your car is all broken down. And so there was this eagerness to say, my car is reliable. Look what it can handle. And so you can see, this is by 1907, this is a map showing all of the different cars that had made a cross-country trip. Wow. Uh, Horatio Nelson Jackson uh, was the, the first man to make a full trip uh, across the country. He was from Vermont. He actually did it on a bet. Someone bet him $50 that he couldn't drive across from San Francisco to New York in less than 90 days. Horatio Nelson Jackson said, you're on, and he did it in 65 days, I think, it was his trip. And uh, he said it cost him you know, $8,000 to do, and he didn't even collect on his $50 bet. He's kind of a stubborn guy. But shortly after he had left, Packard Motor also started to go across the country. They arguably took a much more difficult route. You can see there in red the route they took, because they're taking lots of back roads, there is no highway system, not even a lot of paved roads anywhere in the country at that time. They are the first ones to cross the Nevada desert. Uh, Horatio Nelson Jackson had gone up uh, into uh, Oregon to get around the desert. And, uh, they would actually cross that in a Packard. So this is Horatio Nelson Jackson, who was driving a Winton, which already you can see why Packard would say, well, we got to beat him, right? we got to do better than that rival Winton car. Um, this would draw attention everywhere, all of these early cars. For many cities, this was the first automobile any of them had seen. But here you can see this was a Model F Packard. It took them 63 days. They beat the record. Now, they weren't the first to do it because they started a little bit later, uh, but they beat the other record by a good solid week and took a harder route to do it. I like the, the, some of the stats of their car. A one cylinder, 12 horsepower. Mm -hmm. um, this two person roadster. I love this picture of them in the middle of the desert. Uh, Tom Fetch drove, and there was an editor, Marius uh, Karup, who was, I believe, from England. He was an editor for the Automobile magazine. And they're out in the middle of the desert. I just love the umbrella on their car, which makes a lot of sense if you're driving through the desert, but you know, how quaint does that look, right? <laughs> on their little roadster. And here you can see that it was called the Old Pacific. Um, and they, they have it preserved basically in all of that dirt. And this is you know, a one cylinder engine. There's not a lot. You know, sometimes when you look under the hood of, I think, of like a modern sports car or something, and there's you know, more. Here you open the hood, and mostly you just see the ground. There's not a lot in there uh, underneath uh, in the action. Uh, so this was a huge publicity coup for Packard to have been one of the first cars to cross the country successfully. 
So that was the idea of Henry Joy. Uh, if you can see, he was born during the Civil War, but would live well in the 1930s. Henry Joy was so impressed by an early Packard automobile, like 1902, that he bought one, and then he said, I'm going to get all of my rich friends to get together, and we're going to buy the entire company. Uh, they got $250,000 they invested. They gained a controlling interest uh, in Packard Motor. And uh, Henry Joy was from Detroit. And he thought that that's where the company should be. Uh, wasn't quite the Motor City yet, but Henry Joy actually did a lot to make it the Motor City by saying we're going to relocate from Warren, Ohio, uh, all the way to Detroit. Now, when he did that, uh, James Packer wasn't really interested in coming along uh, with him. He said, I don't want to move to Detroit. I like Warren, Ohio. It's where I'm from. He was still enjoying driving around. And by that point, again, James Packard had been rich before he even started the car company. Uh, this is one of these other side things. James Ward Packard was also a horologist. He liked time and clocks. And he had some of the most impressive pocket watches of the 20th century made. Because uh, he would live into the 1920s and he just was idly wealthy and had tons of money. Uh, look at this watch. It has, you know, calendar day, uh, has, you know, the time of sunrise, the time of sunset, um, the day of the week. All of this built into one pocket watch. And the most impressive part was when he flipped it over. Wow. This was a, a picture of the constellations as they would appear over Warren, Ohio, in his wow. home. They would like move throughout the day. And that's all in like one watch on your pocket watch. This was like a fifteen thousand dollar pocket watch in the nineteen teens. I don't know. That was really impressive to me. I thought it was really cool. So that's basically kind of not the end of James Ward Packard, but his involvement in the Packard Motor Company. I'm sure he drove them the rest of his life. Uh, but he said, "Thanks, I got it started." It's got a good reputation. I'll lend my name to it. Take care. So there's uh, where Packard is uh, buried in Warren, if you've ever gone out to see him. Um, Henry D. Joy. There's a great picture of Henry Joy in downtown Detroit behind the wheels of uh, a great big Packard there with his goggles on and everything. I just really love this picture and the blur on either side of him as he sits. But he was very involved in the company. And uh, he also really liked cars, as I mentioned before. One of the other things that Henry Joy was well known for was, and the thing that he said in his life he appreciated the most, was that he was a founding member of the Lincoln Highway Association. And he said, what this country needs is good roads. And so he was a huge driving force behind building the Lincoln Highway across the country. And he said that was the greatest accomplishment in his life. And obviously it sure helped him, because the more good roads there were, the more chances people would have to buy a nice Packard automobile to drive on them, right? Or any kind of car. Um, Henry Joy, uh, again, he's somebody we could do a whole biography on. One of my other favorite things about him is he starts out as a pretty ardent anti uh, or a ardent prohibitionist. He's a member of the Anti-Saloon League. And he thinks, you know, drinking should be outlawed in the country and helps to get prohibition passed. He loves doing that until he's got a great big mansion on the Detroit River, and multiple times um, police raid his house looking for booze. They think that rum runners are using his house. He's like, what are you doing? I helped to pass prohibition. Why are you raiding my house? In fact, he had a gardener uh, who was taking his, or a uh, mechanic, I guess it would have been, who took one of his boats out of the boathouse when he was coming back. He couldn't hear, the police were shouting at him, he couldn't hear him over the engine, the cop shot his mechanic, killed him. And Henry Joy was like, this is ridiculous, and then became one of the strongest opponents of prohibition, and helped get it repealed. So, <laughs> yes, we can all clap for Henry Joy. So, uh, as I mentioned, you know, founder of that Lincoln Highway. But this is what the Packard Motor Company uh, looked like uh, in Detroit uh, by 1903 when they had moved there. Uh, they started to offer other products as well. One of the first things they noticed was that a lot of people seemed to like Packard had built like a one-off custom truck to haul components around. And people said, oh, there's a huge need for trucks. And a lot of people don't associate trucks with Packard Motor. They think of the elegant cars, but they did make uh, trucks like this as well. I really like how much of a wagon this looks like and that great steering wheel placement, you know, straight out like that. Hard rubber tires doesn't go very fast mm -hmm. at all. But by 1904, the Packard Touring Model L. Now, I don't intend to go over every single Packard model or series. One of the things that Packard does, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is that Packard uh, didn't really obey the normal Detroit convention of going by model year. Uh, they went by series. 
And the thing is, sometimes a series would last like two or three years where they'd be using basically the same car, the same uh, model type and everything like that. Sometimes it was as short as seven months before they're just like, in, out, that one's gone. Uh, and it would average out to about one a year. So why they didn't just do like the model year convention like everyone else and said, all right, it's new year, here's the new car. I don't know, they're just kind of a long way around. They said that they didn't have to do that. But this Model L would have a couple of features. One of the biggest ones is that uh, radiator shell. This is, um, if there's one thing, it's kind of defined by Packard. You can see this ad for a $3,000 uh, car in 1904, which is $104,000 today. Uh, so, you know, you could buy a Packard or a house. It was kind of the uh, price options and the kind of people who would be buying Packards. Uh, at that time. Here's another picture of one of these 1904 Model Ls with that radiator. This is a great one they have at the Henry Ford. If you've been there, it's out on display. Great example of one. But that grill and that kind of tombstone shape uh, to the radiator would be something that Packard would stick with for their entire run in one way or another up through, you know, the 1940s, the 19. Uh, 50s, there were different versions of it uh, into the early 50s as well. And you can see it's a very stylized, but it's still there. It's got that tombstone uh, shape. And even, you know, 1956, it's really, really subtle. But you can see they worked that in. I think that's kind of cool. So that's one of those symbols of Packard. One of the other things they were doing by 1904, the other symbol that Packard was known for, um, here you can see this is like the hub cap, right? That actually goes on the hub of the wheel. Well, they would eventually, by 1905, they'd have this hexagon came in black, and if your car went back to the dealership, which a lot of those early cars did frequently because they would need to have something rebuilt or repaired, again, these are very experimental type cars, when you had one of these overhauled by the dealership, they'd paint it red mm. uh, to show like, hey, this one's been serviced, it's been back, and a lot of people are like, that looks sharp, I like <laughs> that, and so, lo and behold, you know, Packard would uh, use that. By 1908, they're using this Packard uh, script on the side. And so they would use that tombstone grill, the Packard script, that hexagon, and you can see even on some of their ads, they put, you know, ask the man who owns one in that distinctive radiator, and they'll even put that in brass on some of their cars. And that red hexagon really became shorthand uh, for Packard. They would use it on things like luggage racks. So even though it originally came from a hubcap, they would use it on other parts of the car. It's just kind of a neat little uh, symbol. They would even use this, and again, this is much later on, um, there's a few years in the 50s where Packard has somewhat of an identity crisis where they start creating a car called a Clipper. And is a Clipper a separate model or is it a separate make? Uh, it probably depends on who you ask or who at the Packard factory you got that day. Because some people said, oh, it's a completely different car. Kind of like a similar thing happens with Chrysler. For a while there's the Chrysler Imperial, but then some years Imperial is its own make that's separate from Chrysler and they kind of waffle on it a little bit. So at one point they have a, a cheaper car called a Clipper, and what did they do? They had what's well, nautical themed, obviously, but in the center there's that red hexagon ties it back uh, to Packard. So kind of cool. Even in 1958, that last year when this is made in South Bend, Indiana, they still were stamping out a couple of hubcaps with that red hexagon mm -hmm. on it. It's one of those really cool symbols of Packard. Mm -hmm. All right, so we talked a little bit about symbols. Um, again, we'll jump back in time a little bit. Packard um, started to name a lot of their models as well, based off of their horsepower, you know, a Model 24 and 24 horsepower, a Model 30 at 30 horsepower. Uh, this was one of their first cars, they called it the mile a minute car, because it could go 60 in 1906. Also, I just wanted to point out, I wanted to use this picture really bad, because uh, there's obviously some ladies checking out this sweet roadster. Look how cool that guy is. He's wearing his hat backwards in 1906. <laughs> like, that's really cool, right? Like, I don't know. I thought that was neat. You don't often see the backwards baseball hat in 1906, but it's Packard out. He's a cool guy. You know, by um, 1910, um, they have done, uh, this is a Packard 30. They also have like, the Packard 18. So again, these are low horsepower cars by comparison to the rest of the 20th century. Still very expensive and very, very luxurious as well. By 1910, they've expanded the factory operations. Henry B. Joy is actually contracted. Albert Kahn, uh, who's well known as probably the best industrial architect of the 20th century. If you want to know more about him, I do an entire lecture on Albert Kahn. He's a really cool guy. But he builds the Packard plant. This is the one that they you know, have demolished in Detroit that was so famous. And it's really one of the first reinforced concrete buildings in the world where they would have lots of room and they could really 
tool up and rather than be making cars individually, uh, they could be concentrating on mass production. Here you can see uh, the Packard plant and how big uh, this would eventually get to make you know, hundreds and thousands of cars. By 1912, one of these other big landmark years for Packard, they finally offered a six-cylinder car. And that six-cylinder car would give them a little bit more horsepower and that would really cement them as now, finally, cars aren't as experimental in 1912. The Model T is out. People kind of know what they're doing, and people are starting to see where are these cars going to line up to look at each other. You know, we today we kind of all intuitively know, like, oh, a Cadillac, that's really nice. You know, um, a Nissan, eh, that's kind of you know entry level car, and we know that. Um, back then, all of these companies are so new. Who's to say, you know, a Buick is not a Cadillac? The idea of calling something the Cadillac of X. No one would have said that in 1912, at least not yet. But finally, by about this time, people are starting to realize, where do these cars all fit with each other? What's nice, what's not? Obviously, something that costs the amount of a house should be a pretty nice car. But with the addition of that six-cylinder engine, Packard became one of the three P's, as they were known. What are the other two P's? Anybody know this one? Peerless. Peerless. Pierce Arrow. Pierce There's a bunch of Pierce Arrows with their cool headlights built into the fenders. It's kind of their shtick. And of course, Peerless. So Peerless, Pierce Arrow, and Packard were the three major cars of the United States. Um, so they are turning out some really, really high quality cars. Packard is still making trucks by this point, which is kind of neat. This one, Inner City Trucking Service, Detroit to Flint. Um, great big trucks uh, as well that still use that big radiator tombstone. I just think this is an underappreciated part of Packard's legacy. Look at the logs this guy's hauling. Mm -hmm. That's a very serious uh, looking truck for sure. Um, so they make lots of those trucks. Now by 1916, uh, Henry B. Joy is still, he's the president, he's also on the board of Packard Motor. And he's good friends with Charles Nash. Charles Nash had been the president of GM briefly, uh, and he was basically forced out by William Durant. Billy Durant was helped found GM, the board kicks him out, he starts another company, comes back, he does this like a couple of times, he's a really charismatic guy. Well, Billy Durant comes again and Charles Nash is out. Nash would go on to buy a car company that was already available uh, over in Wisconsin, the Jeffrey Company, which had had then renamed itself because he had a lot of ideas about this. And of course, what does he rename the company? He renames it after himself. That's going to be Nash. In 1916, right as they started, Henry Joy said, hey, there's a great opportunity. We want to make more cars. I think Nash and Packard submerge. And the Packard board said, absolutely not. And so in kind of a, a fit of anger, um, uh, Henry Joy quits. He just says, fine, I'm not going to be the president anymore. I'll sit on your board, but if you won't let me merge with who I want to merge with, when I want to merge, and that's going to be a recurring story in the history of Packard, um, I'm out. And so he's gone, and Elvin uh, McCauley is in. He's going to be the president of Packard uh, well into the 1940s. There he is on the cover of Time. In 1929 in July, where everything's going great and going to go great for the foreseeable future. No road bumps ahead, right? in the summer of 1929. Uh, by the middle of the teens, uh, one of the other things that Packard was well known for is they did finally increase their engine size again. If six cylinders is good, how about a twin six, two sets of six cylinders, a V12. They're the first to offer a commercial V12. And I would argue, in the history of automobiles, uh, an argument can certainly be made that this is really what starts the interest and obsession with horsepower in the United States and how much horsepower your engine can produce. We all know that's something everybody loves to talk about. How much horsepower you got? How much, oh, I got a big V8 because it's got lots of horsepower. Before that, it's just one of the facts and figures. I mean, it's the same as like, oh, what's the wheelbase of that car? You know, the car companies aren't fighting over who has the biggest wheelbase or anything like that. But with this twin six, they set a standard. It's a Cadillac, you got a V8, don't care. We got a V12 and puts out more horsepower. A lot of these early cars in the teens, it was not unusual to have a car that would have like 30 horsepower or 18 horsepower. That's just not a lot. This is where they make that a benchmark. And so, you know, if you enjoy a big muscle car in the 60s, in some ways I say you have Packard uh, to blame for that, for starting that interest in that being a way to kind of measure a car against another. 85 horsepower 
you know, in 1916. Uh, 424 cubic inches is a huge engine uh, for that time. And these were luxurious cars. Uh, one of these twin sixes in 1916 is sent out to the Tsar of Russia. Tsar Nicholas gets one. They put skis on the front. He's got, talk about a snowmobile, right? That looks like a fun vehicle to drive around in. I kind of often wonder what happened to this. Because, uh, you know, about a year later, the Tsar is going to have not a fun time. Splat in his car. You know? Somewhere. Uh, but this twin six was, uh, they met at a 60 degree angle, everything was perfectly balanced and offset, and it was the start of these really well built engines that Packard would be known for for a long time. Now, in 1914, another famous car incident in history, of course, the Archduke and his wife go for a ride that does not turn out well for them, they're assassinated, and World War I starts, right? And now all of a sudden, a lot of the world's car makers, especially in Europe, start making armored cars. I thought about putting one of the classic Rolls-Royce armored cars from World War I, but then I thought it was way cooler when I found this picture of a panhard French armored car, which I don't know how much confidence that would inspire in me to drive around. But Packard would still make automobiles. They would make trucks. Here's a Packard for Pershing um, at that time. So they would make some of these huge Liberty trucks. And there was a new mode of transportation on the scene, airplanes. Packard is well known for its engines, here you can see this is Hap Arnold, a um, major Air Force figure from World War II. That's him with the first completed um, Liberty engine that was based on that twin uh, six architecture. That is a wow. nice engine. And also, to give you a sense of scale, well, actually, before I get to that, uh, here's one picture. Packard would, for a while, they'd use their radiator and they'd put an airplane on it. It's one of the rare Packard markings. But they were really proud of making these airplane engines for Uncle Sam. Uh, Henry Joy, in fact, owned a bunch of land north of Detroit, and he set up an airfield to test all of these airplanes. He would then give it, this was originally called Joy Field, before they renamed it after Mr. Selfridge, who was the first person to be killed in an airplane. Uh, but this was a Packard airport where they could test out those Packard airplane engines. It became Selfridge Field, that's what it looks like uh, today. So if you've ever driven north of Detroit, when you get to uh, Mount Clemens, you see the great big World Trade Center, you're right there near Selfridge Air Force Base. So again, some of these huge engines mm. that Packard would be known for, they'd do the same thing in World War II where they'd wind up making lots and lots of engines. They'd uh, redo the Merlin engines from uh, Great Britain. They were powering P-51s and other planes. They were well known. Uh, they also made PT boat engines. Uh, mm. These are engines, to give you an idea how big they are, here's Mr. Leno himself with a car with one of these giant Packard engines to power it, uh, just to give you a sense of scale, just how big that engine is. In the 1920s, they were building those marine engines, which would initially uh, power people like Gar Wood, um, Chris Craft, those are up in my neck of the woods, St. Clair County, they were building really, really fast boats. No coincidence that, hey, all these power boats seem to be really popular during Prohibition, right on the river between like, <laughs> Michigan and Canada, I wonder why. Um, look at the power. This guy's got four of these Packard engines uh, that they would make. So this is something that Packard's legacy would be well established by. Um, it would be Packard engines that would power PT boats uh, during World War II as well. So really, really interesting to see kind of that's what Packard's legacy is. Uh, by the end of World War I, um, they are back into the you know, car manufacturing game. There's a small recession in the early 1920s really doesn't seem to affect Packard much at all. And by 1924, they have moved on from the twin six, as popular as that was, and they would adopt something, the engine they were perhaps most well known for, their straight eight. They would be packing this straight eight from 1924 until 1954 in one version or another. It's pretty amazing to think that like these cars kind of have the same engine in them. <laughs> Obviously, you know, engines do last a while, but this one was particularly uh, long lived as well. They're well known for how smooth they could be, the amount of power and torque they could produce. There were lots of people who said, oh, I only use two or three of the cylinders, give me all the power I need, and you know the rest of them are just along for the ride. And they kind of would write to uh, Packard and say that. There were other people who said, oh, yeah, the Packard straight eight is like the only engine that you can just start in high gear, and this thing will torque and power its way through. You don't even need to shift gears. You should, but you don't have to. You got so much power at your disposal, and you know a fun trick with one of these is if you got it running, you know you just balance a quarter up on the head of that engine. And that's how smooth that that engine uh, will run. 
And so they would uh, they play that up a little bit. There's one of those other symbols of Packard. This is 1928, uh, where they would be using this crest, the Packard family crest. This is right around the time James Packard died in 1928. They kind of out of here by starting to use that. That makes a lot of appearances on uh, Packard pieces. Also in 1928, uh, Packard made another major change to the automobile industry. They created a proving ground. Has anyone here ever been to the Packard proving grounds? Really amazing site. If you ever get a chance to go up there, there's only a couple buildings you can see here that are left. Um, and they are all Albert Kahn design. It's a really cool site. They have some cool car shows up there as well. So if you get the chance, go to it. There was this enormous track. So Packard was the first car company to say, hey, you know, instead of just like driving around a couple blocks of the factory to test the car out, we should make a dedicated you know, test track. They said this giant banked oval here was so well engineered and so well banked that you could put a car, get it going as fast as you could, just stomp on the accelerator, and they said you could just let go of the wheel, and the track was so perfectly banked that you would just stay in it. And they said this was one of the fastest places you could drive a car in America uh, because it was so uh, well designed. And you can see their other torturous stress track there, so you could go through sand or mud or water, and they would put all these cars through their paces. And eventually everybody else gets test tracks as well after this. But Packard, again, would pioneer this. Now Packard by this point has a, a great reputation in the country in the 1920s, the early 1930s. Uh, a lot of my friends today who you know might not have heard of Packard, you know, they've been gone quite a while. If you're not really into cars, you're like, I don't know about, much about that. Or somebody will ask me, well, is Packard a nice car? And I say, well, you know how if you're a doctor or a lawyer, you aspire to, you know, you, you drive a Cadillac or a Lincoln. Well, if you're a senator or the president of a company or the president of a country, you drive a Packard. You know, you get ridden around in a Packard. Somebody else drives your Packard for you, right? That's kind of the reputation that Packard has. This is the car for movie stars. So this is what Cadillac and Lincoln wish they were. This is, you know, a step above that. You know, just cost, quality, and reputation. So there you can see FDR waving his hat around in the back of this great big pack over there. Of course, no uh, talk would be complete without mentioning the Great Depression. And no talk about the Great Depression, you have to show the car, the guy you know, selling his car for a hundred bucks on Wall Street. It seems like that would be really bad news for a major car designer whose entire market is the luxury car market. Oh no, no one has any money anymore, we sell high-end cars. Packard does a couple strategies to make it through the Great Depression, because it would eventually kill off. Like, Peerless, Pierce Arrow, they're gone by the end of the Great Depression. They don't make it. Packard does. And so I like this ad of, like, why pay the price of a Packard? They know a Packard is incredibly expensive. They will continue to talk about the quality. And their plan was basically, well, you know, a Depression seems to make a lot of people uh, who are maybe moderately wealthy, poor. But guess what? If you're super rich, <coughs> Even during the Depression, you're still super rich. You know, depressions don't really impact multimillionaires or billionaires. You know, we think about those kind of downturns. If anything, some of those people get even richer during them. So uh, Packard would actually just lean in to being this high-priced car. They would actually uh, work with groups like LeBaron and Dietrich to make these custom cars that would be a limited run of like 12, and they would just be a fortune. And a lot of people say this is just the zenith of Packard. At the depths of the Depression, when the country had the least amount of money, Packard was just putting out amazing automobiles that were so limited in their design. They're classic. These are some of the most beautiful cars ever built. I think that's a pretty objective statement. Um, and they're you know, ultra uh, rare, ultra valuable uh, today to see these kinds of cars. And you're like, look at that. That is just the classiest looking car you're ever going to see. And they just said, well, you know what? Even though we only have a market of like five or six people, of those multimillionaires, they are going to have a Packard. We have to still be that uh, person. And they said the Depression won't last forever. This will be over in a couple of years and we'll move on. Well, by 1933, 1934, they realized, oh, yeah, this Depression isn't just going away. This is uh, kind of rough. What do we do? That's when they make a decision that was kind of controversial to a lot of people in the Packard world. They decide to extend to look for a new market. So we've got to have something a little bit cheaper for other people to buy. We cannot just exclusively market to the top end. So they start selling um, things like the 120 model, which was a reference to their wheelbase. This is still a beautiful car. This is one from uh, the late 30s. 
but this was a little bit more affordable uh, for somebody like a doctor or a lawyer. They could compete a little bit easier with, you know, Cadillac or even high-end Buicks, things like that, uh, with these more affordable Packards. So you can see, again, still, you know, a, a piece of beauty, view, very gorgeous uh, car, but a little bit cheaper. They would even introduce, you know, a 110 a little bit later on by the 1940s. Again, beautiful car, but they now have a different market that they're marketing toward. They'll still churn out a couple of those senior cars throughout the 30s, but by the 1940s, that idea of the Packard that costs more than a couple of houses is kind of gone by the wayside. Now, there is one other guy who gets involved in Packard at this point in the late 30s, the very early 40s, Howard Darren, uh, Dutch Darren, as a lot of people knew him, was a, a fancy car designer. He's well known for his signature Darren dip, which is very subtle on this car, but kind of in the back, you can see that little tiny dip. Here's something where it's a little bit more obvious in the back. They would bring on Dutch Darren to design uh, some of these uh, limited run Packards that were you know, real gorgeous looking uh, cars that they could still sell to a higher end market. And eventually, uh, they would actually come out with, they were going to call it the Clipper. 1942, this was heavily inspired by Dutch Darren. So Dutch was actually from, he was working mostly in Europe, I think he was in France, when World War II out, uh, breaks out, and he says like, see, this doesn't seem fun, I'm going to leave and come to the United States. And so he began working with these higher end clientele. He's kind of a freelance designer, does a lot of this work for Packard. And so you can finally see the Clipper beauty pays off in more miles per gallon. That should really tell you just what everything you need to know about how Packard has changed who its audience is. Because if you're selling a car that today costs, you know, $100,000, do you think you tout to the person who buys that car what great gas economy it gets? No, they don't care. They probably own a gas station or a couple of them or a whole oil company. That's not something a rich person cares about, the gas economy. Here, in one of their ads, they're telling people, this gets good mileage. And that should tell you a lot about how Packard has now changed by the 1940s. One more innovation right at this time. Packard, if you've ever been driving on a hot day and turned on the AC, Packard is the very first company to offer air conditioning uh, in their car. Here you can see all the cold arrows moving up from this huge compressor in the back seat. I was talking to a guy who had one of these um, car show a couple of years ago. He said he turned on the air conditioner, he got it working again, and it serviced. And at first he's like, man, it's just not getting the cold up here. But then he said, like, God, that there was a bug or something in the car. He was swatting at the back of his neck and finally looked around and he realized that it got so cold in such a small spot, it was ice chips that were blowing up from the back of the car and like smacking him in the back of the neck. So it was kind of all or nothing with this very early air conditioning. You're going to get hit by pieces of ice or it would be on. I also love this picture. Uh, what do you think this does for your horsepower? Look at that air conditioning uh, compressor. This thing's huge. I mean, it looks like a you know, supercharger, but it's just, just for the AC. World War II uh, comes along. This is the last Packard off the line. And Packard, as we mentioned before, is going to make a lot of airplane engines, uh, boat engines, staff cars. They're all in for war production like every other car. And here they would tell you, you know, like, oh, what you can learn. What is this? What every motorist can learn from a Mustang pilot. You know, come out of the sun and shoot your enemy down when you can't see him, right? Um, that's what you learn when you drive a Packard. Um, this is not a Packard. Uh, this is actually a Russian car. It's one of the other things Packard wound up doing during the war. A lot of their dies uh, for making some of these earlier Packard cars were sent to the Soviet Union as part of Lend-Lease. And Stalin got a hold of these. And so um, this is, a, I think, a Zis 110. It's basically a cheap copy of a Packard with these kind of worn-out dyes that Packard had sent overseas. And in fact, if you had visited Moscow any time in the 50s or 60s, um, they turned a bunch of them into taxis. So they'd be like, oh, yes, in Soviet Union, you ride around in very nice Packard-like <laughs> taxi. You know, very high-quality car um, to kind of show people. Of course, uh, World War II ends. Everyone's very happy. And the first thing everybody wants is a new car. So I figured you guys would like this. The first by far of the post car war is, of course, Studebaker, right? So everyone wants a new car. Um, now, I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but as beautiful as this 47 Studebaker is, that may have been a bit of a strategic blunder by Studebaker. Because Studebaker spent a lot of time developing this brand new car, a lot of resources into it, when GIs and these guys who had just spent years at war have a ton of money couldn't buy a new car for the last four or five years, 
guess what? They'll buy anything that runs. If it has four wheels, they'll buy it. There was no need to innovate because the big three are taking a little bit longer to get their new models back on the road. They just kind of warm over some of the pre-war stuff. And nobody cares. As long as it's a car that runs, they'll buy it. So maybe a little bit of misplaced effort for I don't know how much of a return they got from that in being that first by far. But one of the neat things is both Studebaker, cars like this, um, uh, Kaiser here, or this Fraser here, Kaiser Fraser, they would go to a new kind of design called slab siding, where you know it looks kind of like a bathtub. Nash would do um, the same thing as well. But of all the bathtub cars, Packard really just added a bunch of sheet metal onto their pre nineteen their 1942 pre-war car. Is it to keep fleshing it out? They add about 200 pounds of sheet metal. And you can see why a car like this, especially you see one in kind of like a gray or a dark color like this, would be called the pregnant elephant. Um, this was just kind of the most bloated looking car. But a lot of people who were buying this didn't really care. They didn't say, eh, the styling was either you liked it or you didn't. But a lot of them said, well, it's a Packard. It still has that reputation and prestige. And so 1948 would actually be one of Packard's best years for selling cars. They moved something like 75, 80,000 cars that year, which is nothing in comparison to Ford or Chevy or Plymouth, but for their market, did pretty well. And in fact, by 1949, you could even get one of them in gold because it was Packard's golden anniversary. They were 50 years old. There's a picture of the Packard Proving Guns. Look at it. It's a black and white photo. But these are all that beautiful gold colored cars. You can buy one of their anniversary cars. They were very excited to celebrate that anniversary. That's right around that time. Uh, James Nance uh, becomes the president of Packard. He has some really interesting ideas. The old guy, uh, I think his name was uh, Church, uh, was ousted when the pregnant elephants kind of whatever got these like mixed reviews. They said, we were the ports and we want somebody new in. And so they bring in Nance, and Nance says, all right, we're going to spice things up a little bit. Now, at this point, they are still using that straight eight engine, um, but it's a little bit better. It's a little less frumpy looking, but it's kind of got this reputation of looking like an old man's car. It's a big boat. It's got this really old engine in it. It's got this reputation of like, oh, doctors and lawyers and rich old men drive these. And they said, we want to try and go after you know, a bit of a younger market, and even a cheaper market. So again, without having that junior series, that 110, that 120 series, this is where they spin things off to the clipper, where it's like, what is this car? Is this a Packard, or is this a different make? Because like, up there on the hood, it is a clipper. It doesn't say Packard anywhere on this. And some of them, in you know 55 like this, they eventually had to put like Packard on the trunk, and a lot of dealers insisted on that because they said people are coming in and they think they're buying a Packard or they're paying a Packard price, but they're getting this thing that you're calling a Clipper, and it doesn't say Packard anywhere on it, but it's Clipper by Packard or what? What's the deal? And they were not even sure uh, themselves. But finally, there, James Nance really pushes for a couple of last really big innovations to really throw Packard back into the mix. So the Packard V8. It was a really cool V8. It was the first uh, V8 that Packard was going to offer uh, for 55 and 56. Um, they rushed that out to replace that long straight eight. So here you can see the free breathing Clipper Custom. And they would also have the Ultramatic, the Ultramatic Drive, new for 52. So they would embrace some of these very modern ideas of having automatic transmission. They'd even have push button transmission, you know, kind of like Edsel did, a few other cars did, into uh, the 60s. Well, let's talk about the landscape just a little bit here in the early 1950s. The big three are absolutely dominating things. This is when the big three are GM's the most powerful company on earth in the early 1950s. It's inconceivable to them to think that GM would ever go through a, you know, a bankruptcy. Because they were just so powerful at that time. In 1954, uh, Henry Ford II and the board at Ford said they were going to do everything they could to take over Chevy have the best-selling car. So Chevy and Ford got into a price war with one another. And a lot of people attribute that price war in 1953 uh, to the downfall of the independent car companies because no one could compete with them. No one could compete with them before, but as soon as they made it their goal, at any cost to slash prices, to move more product at Ford and Chevy, they knew they were done. So, you know, even Studebaker, you know, they're, they're doing pretty well, but they're, you know, a distant distant, you know, fifth place behind some of these big three companies um, that are turning things out. And you can see they're going after different markets. They're, again, saying, oh, these are, you know, economical, uh, an economy car. 
We've got groups like Nash here with a new kind of car, the Metropolitan Nash is going to offer these little tiny cars, which some people have experimented with. You know, Powell Crosley and the Crosley Car Company was small. There are a few others. Americans don't really like small cars. They're always a niche market, but Nash says, oh, that's you know, what we'll try and do. You know, Hudson, again, uh, they're going to uh, talk about their race cars for the national champion of uh, stock car racing they are able to offer. And so they'll try and play up their performance. But nobody can compete with Ford and Chevy on price. So this is George Mason. George Mason, Mason was the president of Nash. Uh, it's a big old cigar, big old guy in a suit. I don't know, I kind of like him. Uh, and he says, he's got a good idea. So he says, what if we merge all of the independent companies? If we merge Nash, Hudson, Studebaker, Packard. That's kind of what GM was. GM is well known for their, you know, pyramid. Cadillac at the top, Chevy at the bottom. And you have different types of car brands for different types of people. And they said, you know, we're running these independent country, companies that are kind of like a broken up GM. You know, Packard's up at the top. You know, maybe you got, you know, Studebaker in the middle. You know, low place Nash. Hudson's also towards the top. And he said, if we merged in one big company, we could not Chrysler out of third place. We'd be the big three. Or there'd be a big four. And so Mason pitches this idea to a lot of people. I love this picture of George Mason trying to drive a Metropolitan. He does not want to have a home in this very early uh, Metropolitan. And he is able to get as far as merging Nash and Hudson into the American Motor Corporation. And, and George Mason, I know he looks like the paragon of health in those two pictures, drops dead. Uh, and... George Romney takes over the new AMC. They are not able to continue this merger. George Romney had come up uh, from the appliance division at Calvinator uh, at Nash, and James Nance had worked for um, a different competing uh, appliance company earlier on in his career, so they didn't like each other very much. So George Romney said, nah, we're good. American Motors doesn't need Packard or Studebaker. I think they wanted Packard. But Studebaker, by this point, uh, was kind of toxic. Um, they were kind of running out of money. Their facilities were very, they were very cash poor, and their facilities were very outdated. They had a large dealership base. They were still moving a fair amount of product. But Studebaker, their board had chosen to take a lot of the profits they had made from World War II, because all the car companies made a ton of money, and they turned it into stock buybacks. They turned it into dividends. They were giving a lot of money away that maybe if the board had been a little bit more forward-thinking, they would have upgraded, you know, the assembly line in South Bend, or some of these decisions that it's ultimately going to cost Studebaker a little bit down the road. They're making short-term gains in uh, the, the expense of long-term profitability. But the thing is, again, all of these independents, you know, Studebaker, by the time they go out of business in the 60s, uh -huh. you know, they're making like one-tenth of one percent of cars for the market. They just realize we can't compete with the big three. The volume's not there. What's the point of this? And they diversify into plenty of other products like that. And so the writing on the wall is here with some of these earlier issues. But Studebaker, Packard merge. And it's a merge. Packard has far more money on hand. So Packard essentially buys Studebaker. And it's a merger, but it is kind of a purchase. And Studebaker figures, again, they can get some of the advantages out of this plan system that uh, Mason had had. They said, all right, well, Packard can bring the money, they got the capital, and they got a high-end car, but Studebaker has the dealership base, they can sell some of the volume, it'll be great. Well, as soon as they merge, everybody kind of gets a look at the books, and they realize, uh, this maybe isn't so great. What are we going to do? Now we have two com almost like competing lines. We've got factories in Detroit, we've got factories in South Bend. They're not working well with each other, but for Packard, their last hurrah, they, invent, or they add some of these last innovations that they ever worked on and put them in these 55, 56 Packards, which some people say are the nicest Packards ever made. There are things like their torsion level ride suspension, great big torsion bars at the back that make this car ride. They had an electric motor that could tighten them up. So if you put a big heavy sack of cement in the trunk, it would still ride level. And here you can see you know, these beautiful Caribbeans here with that V8, the torsion suspension. Studebaker in 56, now this is the first year of that, you know, kind of merger of Studebaker and Packard. Uh, they're still selling that economy car, so there's that idea that they can kind of compete, but they still can't compete with volume. 
And uh, one of the problems that they're going to run into, you know, here is, of course, you know, a Studebaker. They're doing well um, with some of their styling, but they would offer things like the Scotsman. This is a great example of one of the reasons that this merger is kind of ultimately a failure. One of the things that they discovered, they would shut down production in Detroit uh, at Packard. They said, we, want to consult we have to consolidate everything to South Bend. Try and save money because we're hemorrhaging cash. And they realized they couldn't. They had this great brand new Packard that had these brand new things, like a brand new V8, torsion suspension, all these great innovations. It was literally too big to fit down the small assembly line in South Bend that hadn't been updated in years and years. And they said, we have all those great innovations. We can't afford to run two factories. And so they basically bet on Studebaker and closed down Packard production in Detroit. This is a great example of why Packard was, was finally done uh, and, and very much doomed from that point. So this is the Scotsman. You guys are all Studebaker people, so you know this. This was you know, cheap, right? And that was the whole point. You have your know, painted hubcaps. You got my favorite like hood badge of all time. Just S, just one little <laughs> tiny S up on the front. Very cheap. All right, so you might be able to pick up one of these for like 1500 bucks. Now for $4,000, you could get this, which looks a little bit different. This is the same car. Like, it uses mostly the same body panels. There's a bunch of stuff glued to the outside. But for most intents and purposes, it's the same frame, it's the same size. There's different stuff glued onto it in 58. And it's going to cost like three times as much. People are going to get that and they're like, did I pay more than a Cadillac for what is essentially a Scotsman with some extra plastic glued to it? People weren't, you know, very happy with this. So this is, I mean, they made some really interesting decisions. In 57, the numbers for Packard really fell off a cliff. And by 58, the last year they made Packards, it's because Studebaker Packard had contractual obligations with Studebaker dealerships to deliver a Packard to these you know, Packard dealerships. So they only made about a thousand of these. So Duncan McRae was the designer. He was given virtually no budget, and they said, make this look as different from a you know, base model Studebaker as possible. So they would do that in 58, for example. That's the year they went to quad headlights. So they didn't have room in these nacelles that went back to 54 in the body for quad headlights, so what did they do? They added a little fiberglass extra piece to the pod to make that look wider. There was one fin in the back, but they said, well, if one fin's good, how about two fins? We'll put another <laughs> fin on the fin and make it out of fiberglass. The hood on these cars. It's one of the first cars to use fiberglass as a decorative element. They weren't using that to save weight. They were using it to save money because they didn't want to tool up a whole new die. They couldn't afford it. They said, we only got to make a thousand. Just, you know, put some plywood, make up a couple of bucks, and we'll make these uh, fiberglass hoods uh, to go on these kind of one-off models. One of my favorite examples of Studebaker Packard doing anything to save money is by this point, they were also trying to reuse as many Studebaker, or as many Packard products that they had left over from the last few years as possible. A great example is that front bumper. Notice that front bumper is too wide for the car because it's a Packard bumper that they've now grafted onto this Studebaker <laughs> to make it look different. But it like has this big jug, this big catfish looking mouth. A lot of people are like, oh, that's a really pretty ugly looking car <laughs> coming out of the factory, you know, and, and people were not pleased with these at all. So you can see it's a face that, you know, only only a father can love, right? <laughs> so, oh, but you know, they're doing everything they could. They reused the taillights. These are 56 Packard taillights, and they're pretty cool on there, but you can also see that second fin that they just grafted onto the outside with no money to make these look a little bit better. I've had some at um, some car shows. This is the one that I'm particularly proud of. Anybody here ever heard of the uh, Lemons car show? Uh, the 24 hours of lemons, or instead of Le Mans. Um, this is a car show for hoopties, for oddballs, odd ducks, things like, you know, an Edsel. Edsels, you, you love them or you hate them, right, style-wise. And there wasn't anything physically wrong with them, but they're famous as a failure. This was a great example of, I was very proud that this Packard that was you know, cobbled together won a major award, the Sight for Sour Eyes, like ugliest car from the factory. Because just like, oh boy, that was real rough that they had to turn those out. And a really ignominious end for cars that were widely considered, you know, Packard at their height in the 30s, most beautiful cars in the world, to, oh, we took a Studebaker and glued a bunch of stuff to it. 
Oh, that's a, you know, a far cry from what Packard had been. So I had to replace a door. When I had to replace the door, it was a different color, so I decided to paint uh, the whole thing, because also I said if I was going to have a late 50s car, I wanted a late 50s color. So these are Studebaker Packard company, or colors from uh, 1958. It's called uh, Sea Green, and I think Forest Green was the other one. Uh, Park Green, that's what it was. It's kind of that forest green color uh, for the roof. But this was the end uh, for, for Packard. You know, um, Studebaker would survive. They kind of placed their bet on the Lark. They said, oh, we can beat everybody with this kind of economy car, because there was a recession in 1958. We'll beat everybody to the punch by a year. Lark did great for Studebaker. You know, that's what kept them alive into the 60s. Small car and their small assembly line. And there's an interesting um, kind of coda, because in some ways that 58 Packard was the last Packard, but... In other ways, Packard, this is maybe the last Packard. This is a Packard truck. It's, I mean, really a Studebaker truck. But in uh, South America, there were um, some countries that had these import licenses for Packards. And Studebaker Packard said, well, we got to send them a Packard. We don't want to send them any of these 58, you know, sedans or so. Like, we know that pickup trucks sell well down there. So, like, quick, get out a stamp. We'll put Packard on the tailgate. And this truck is a Packard pickup truck, right? Because that's what it says they had to be on the license to import them down that way. So so this is like the last Packard. And again, one of the, the rarest birds you'll ever see. You know, there are attempts over the years to bring back the some of the iconic imagery or our name plates. You know, they all have been like one-off things. These are kind of similar to, you know, Avante 2 where there have been a couple of companies are like, oh, we're making this Studebaker still. And it's the 80s and like is it really a Studebaker, isn't it? Eh, it kind of depends who you ask, right? I mean, I don't mind this myself. I think that'd be pretty cool looking for a 90s Packard, but um, there's also been recent news. Like last year, Packard Returns! There was actually a company that started making one of these like 34 Packards, although the details are really, really sketchy as to like, what is exactly under the hood of that? How does that work? Is this just a fiberglass like kit car you're trying to make, or... We don't know. There's like one, and again, you can't get too close to it through the ropes. So, this is huge. so Packard still has some cultural cachet. You know, decades, so over 50 years after they ceased to exist as a brand, and people still talk about them and still talk about these as like the height of luxury. So they certainly have made an impact on the United States. Certainly for car lovers, we all know Packard, uh, but I think anybody sees this and they realize the kind of car uh, that Packard was and the legacy that it has. So, again, my name uh, is Andrew Kircher. Uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for letting me uh, come in and talk with all of you about a topic that's near and dear to me. I know you've got business, and hopefully you'll draw my 50-50 ticket. Um, <laughs> but I think I'll stick around, too. So if anybody wants to talk shop, I, uh, I obviously drove down from Port Huron in my packet baker, um, and I'd love to show it to any of you if you want to see it. And uh, it's, again, not a... It's an award winner, but maybe not the award you want to win, right? The yeah. ugliest car at the car show. But um, I'm, I'm really pleased with it. I think it's a unique story and a really cool part of this Packard story. And like I said before, my favorite part is when I get to park next to a you know $200,000 Packard and be like, oh, I also own a Packard. <laughs> ask the man who owns one. I own a Packard and happy to share with all of us. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.